because it uh, put me at ease a little bit. I was worried about my presentation fitting into this session. I uh, was wondering why I was not in an education and outreach one. Uh, I cannot remember exactly how I selected putting into this one, but I think it uh, follows yours uh, quite well. It is not a research talk. It is uh, my uh, ticket to come here. I really wanted to come to the botany meetings. And it's expensive to come here from Puerto Rico. And uh, this project that paid for me to come here, but I had to give a talk. And so that is why I'm giving a talk. So thank you for uh, punching my meal ticket, I guess. In any case, uh, it also fits in with the conference theme of uh, thriving with diversity. Uh, that's really what this is about, is trying to uh, increase participation of underrepresented groups in science. I think from the uh, side of the NSF, which many of us in this type of meeting have been drilled with, uh, we understand about broader impacts. Uh, this is supported by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It comes straight out of their uh, Hispanic Serving Institutions Education Grants Program, which is specifically designed to uh, increase participation uh, of Hispanic students in uh, food and agricultural sciences. Uh, so that is why it uh, is a DNA barcoding project focused on three economically, agriculturally important families. That was uh, to get the USDA's attention, uh, but otherwise the DNA barcoding part uh, as uh, we've had from uh, a couple other presentations in this session, uh, that's kind of what I feel like we here maybe know a little bit more about. Uh, and it worked well to get the USDA's uh, attention and funding. So Puerto Rico is where we're doing this. Uh, it's an interesting place to work. It ranges from uh, very wet. This is an El Yunque rainforest. Uh, this picture strikes me as looking a whole lot like La Selva, have you ever been to uh, La Selva Biological Station where you have these concrete paths because otherwise it would just be a big mud pit because it rains so much. Uh, you're getting that right there uh, to just uh, a few hours away uh, or really just like say 75 kilometers away except that you can't drive anywhere in a straight line. You can get some very arid uh, and dry conditions. So this is the setting uh, where we are doing this. Uh, this is my colleague who uh, is working with, uh, on this project with me, Dimuth uh, Siritunga. Uh, he primarily uh, works with uh, genetics of Manaha and cassava from a crop point of view. And uh, he had previously not done anything with uh, DNA barcoding. And so we partnered uh, together on this, uh, brought in different expertise to uh, undertake this project. And we came up with uh, focusing on uh, these three families, uh, the Clusiaceae, uh, four genera, nine native and naturalized species, four of which are endemic. So we're talking about mostly trees, kind of clamoring shrubs and vines. Cucurbitaceae, uh, up to 17 species, although a lot of them, 11, are introduced, and only uh, two are endemic. And then the big one, uh, Solanaceae, probably the most promising one as well for other research projects. In fact, uh, there's a graduate student associated with this research project who is just now finishing up a master's degree on DNA barcoding these 47 species uh, in Puerto Rico. So what's the uh, basis for this? Uh, basically, Hispanic uh, students are underrepresented in bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. And so the USDA uh, has an entire program dedicated to addressing that and to strengthening uh, that participation. This program is only for Hispanic serving institutions and so uh, it, it, if you're not a Hispanic serving institution the program is not applicable. Uh, University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez hovers at about 99 percent of our students are Hispanic so uh, uh, there's other Hispanic serving institutions that I think the enrollment can be you know, as much as 10% and it still counts. However, for us, uh, you hardly need to do anything 
on campus to recruit specifically Hispanic students, you just any program you do, uh, that's what you're going to get. So here we have uh, a series of students. This is Lumadis, I just mentioned to you. Uh, she's finishing up her master's degree on DNA barcoding Solanaceae for Puerto Rico. And uh, the other ones are undergraduate students have participated in this project. And here we are out uh, doing field work uh, right from our campus, uh, depending on the time of day and traffic, which is a pretty serious uh, constraint. Uh, you can access the whole island within about a two or three hour drive. Uh, the western part of the island is all basically within an hour's uh, radius. And uh, you take more time you know, hiking in the field than what you do driving, which uh, it, for me is important. So these workshops basically consist of the students doing a DNA barcoding project. For the most part, uh, it's the first time they've ever held a pipette. Uh, we have fairly high student to faculty ratio. We have uh, very high demand for research experience and participating in labs. We have a lot of faculty who only teach and who are not conducting active research, so that limits the opportunities. And so for when we do these uh, workshops, uh, for me, it's extremely rewarding to not have to work so hard to recruit a lot of students. All you got to do is put the announcement up, uh, share it on Facebook a little bit or something, and before you know it, you'll have a flood of applications of uh, people that want to participate in your workshops. They're very eager to get this type of experience, and their opportunities are limited, so this type of thing is uh, highly sought after. And it's very rewarding for me because I have been in other situations where recruiting uh, students to participate in research projects can be in labor intensive and uh, it can take some effort. Uh, here, uh, it really comes at you and uh, they, uh, for the most part, have not been involved in research before and they're very eager to do so. So these are, this program at least, what we've been doing are two day long uh, workshops. Uh, one day consisting of wet lab work and then uh, uh, we pretend that we send their actually amplified uh, PCR product. We pretend that we send it off for sequencing. Obviously, it can't be done overnight. Uh, and then we give them uh, data to work with the next day. So they're actually doing PCR. Uh, some of it fails. They, they do the actual chromatograms and everything. And then the second day is bioinformatics. So they, they get their data back and they start analyzing it and start realizing that when you say, oh, I'm just going to sequence DNA from some plant and that's going to tell me what species it is, uh, quite often they realize that it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot more uh, going on. And so the second day is uh, bioinformatics. And at the end of uh, the second day, uh, each group, which is given several species, and so each member of the group uh, can stand up and present uh, their results, they have to stand up, and I always tell them that I want them to do it similar to uh, an expert witness at a DNA trial or something like that, uh, to try to convince everybody, well, this is, uh, this is what uh, this unknown uh, plant sample is. So you can see here on the screen, uh, in addition to using resources such as uh, blast searches and some of the trees that you can generate straight from there, uh, as well as other uh, freely available software programs such as DNA Subway uh, that generates a variety of results, more or less attempting to tell you what you're looking at, then quite often they will also just Google these names and uh, see if that makes some sense. And quite often they will start recognizing these plants from ones that they saw in the field. And one thing that I found is uh, more so than for myself and maybe my generation, for a lot of these people, they will just take pictures with their phone of everything. And uh, so quite often they will come back with a lot of pictures without being told to have done that. And so those are the DNA uh, barcoding uh, workshops that we are doing. We uh, recruit. Um, or we admit to these workshops approximately half students from agriculture and half students from biology. Our biology program <laughs> is very heavy on pre-med and on microbiology. And so for a lot of them, uh, this is their first introduction to organismal biology, plant biology, and uh, we get a lot of applications from people 
who want to go to medical school and they're looking to pad out their uh, resumes with everything they can to go to medical school. But we also try to fill the workshops about half with uh, agriculture students who are much more field oriented. They sometimes already know some of these species and this is their first introduction to molecular biology, to the concept of, uh, of, of DNA, uh, PCR and that kind of thing. They've heard of it, but it's very mysterious to them, and this uh, helps to take the edge off of it. <coughs> One of the requirements that the USDA has uh, is a very extensive uh, questionnaires that the students fill out after these workshops, uh, which is on their platform, and sadly, uh, we as the instructors don't have access to those results. Uh, but but it's uh, a questionnaire very similar, it, it, it's tailored to each student. So depending on how you answer the questions, it'll keep on asking you more questions. Some of these students have spent as much as an hour after these workshops filling the USDA's uh, questionnaire. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is have my own uh, questionnaire. And so uh, for the first four workshops that we did before I abandoned these uh, six questions, I had a questionnaire before and after, and so the first one was done on day one before they had heard me talk about bioinformatics uh, or anything like that. And then uh, over the course of two days, they would uh, do these methods and they would hear from Professor Situnga and myself about things like species concepts, which some of them had never really thought much about. Uh, and then I'd ask them questions at the end, same thing, and one thing that I found, uh, I, I didn't analyze this in any kind of statistical way or anything, but you can see the before and the after. Sometimes the correct response rate can actually go down. Uh, as far as I can tell, for the most part, I, I think there's very little statistical significance in terms of, wow, they're just really answering much better at the end of this. And so it's been a little bit frustrating for me because on paper, at least, it's been hard for me to gauge you know, are they really actually learning stuff? Uh, I can say that just speaking with participants and also uh, when I talk with new applicants who say, hey, I really want to take this workshop, when are you giving this workshop next? Because they've heard about it from other students, they've really enjoyed it, they really feel like they learned a lot. Uh, having said that, I think that some concepts such as species concepts, uh, you know, the difference between you know, morphological species concept and phylogenetic species concept, uh, even simple questions about them, uh, a two-day workshop might not be enough to really get them to start answering correctly uh, about that. So, like I said, I was feeling a little bit insecure about this presentation because it's not like I have a research program and, uh, and hypotheses and everything, and so I wanted to pad it out, like some pictures of my kids and stuff like that. Uh, also because many of you want to hear about our experiences in Puerto Rico with, for example, hurricane. So this is two days after Hurricane Maria, last September. Uh, this is my normal route to work. It goes right by the zoo. This is the fence around the parking lot for the zoo. Uh, it's only about a half a kilometer from here to uh, the biology building. And uh, in the semesters in which I teach early morning classes, you can hear the lions roaring from when I'm lecturing. And you just have to pause and like, hey, listen to that. Isn't that cool? In any case, later on I found out that all these trees also fell in the lions' cages, and they were running around and they were really hungry because the zookeepers hadn't been there for two days. And, uh, and then my kids and I, we climbed over trees for about 15 minutes before we came back, but I think the lions were hungry enough they hung out by their wrecked cages. Uh, but it was basically impassable, uh, so we had to find an alternative uh, route into campus. Uh, here's my kids swimming in the lobby of the building. Uh, fortunately, our barium was just fine. Uh, in fact, when we got there, it was ice cold. The backup generator was working just great, and everything was fine. No problems. The backup generator was only able to run for about 72 hours before running out of fuel, and the nearest fuel was on a tanker in Florida somewhere, and so uh, we did go for several months without electricity and uh, air conditioning and dehumidification. Having said that, the herbarium came through that uh, quite well. So a big storm in Puerto Rico, uh, uh, massive damage. Here is my institution, and we had about $35 million worth of damage. Uh, one thing that I will say 
uh, the hurricane was not the most disruptive thing over the course of, uh, <coughs> for example, these DNA workshops that we've been doing, and for my research agenda uh, in general over the last couple of years. What was far more disruptive was last year's student strike, which put us out of business for over two months, uh, just closed off the campus, and uh, it was very frustrating because you can shut down our campus Normally we have uh, approximately 13,000 students. You can shut it down with only seven students. Uh, you put one on each gate and we're done. Uh, that has been one of the biggest uh, uh, complications for us. So I would uh, like to thank the Department of Agriculture uh, for this support and thank you for listening. Thank you very much.